Time for another What a Shout, brought to you by the Racing Post and our sponsors, Bet365. Welcome back. Another wonderful weekend ahead of us. The sun is shining finally, yes, in May. That is the first news headline coming your way. Will we finally start to see some results and form bedding down? That's the hope. Dave Orton back with you as ever on a Friday morning in the capital. Let's have a look at what's coming up and who is on the panel. What guest have we got for you? Chris Cook joins us back. Chris Frontrunner Cook, I should be saying these days. Thank you, Dave. Yes, good to give a plug for the old column. It's been going well. It's been, it's been great fun. And, well, look, I've managed to get through, um, you know, 50 editions without dying. So that's something. <laughs> it's, it's a lot it's of time. It's about a thousand words every day. So it's... it's um, Plenty of work and getting some winning tips as well. Uh, it, 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 was it Dante week? Was the week? That, wasn't that it? was a very. Good, I mean, the last three weeks <clears throat> have all been profitable. So kills and um, it'll never last. Tom Segal, watch your back then. Um, yes, I bet they're very worried. <laughs> they probably are with the year they're having. Okay, let's go to Pat Cooney then from our sponsors, Bet Three Six Five. Good morning, Pat. Good morning to you and good morning to Roger and to Chris as well. So looking forward to a good show. Yes, indeed. Tease there for you. We scour the racing world for the best guest every week. And after a rather notable weekend last week, we thought, who better than to get for you than to Roger Varian. Thanks for coming on, Roger. Good morning, Dave. Here we are looking what marvellously presented. We were questioning whether you ever sleep, Roger. I have to say that. You've been up already. We're filming this early, just to let you know, viewers out there. We're in the capital nice and early. When you get in this building before the cleaners, you know you're in trouble. And uh, yet Roger was still messaging me late at night. Do you ever sleep, Roger? You've got three children as well, for goodness sake, man. I'm a good sleeper, so when I do sleep, I sleep very well. But um, no, it's a, it's a demanding time of the year. We're, we're, we're up late often with commitments and you know the work starts very early but it, uh, it it's all good we're, we're we're very happy to be busy and Chris when I mentioned to you perhaps does Roger sleep you said well he has taken over at Carlberg which was Clive Britton's old yard wasn't he <laughs> Clive was famous for sort of being up in the middle of the night to exercise his horses when it was still dark you know and I, I just wonder if Roger feels pressure to carry on that grand tradition uh, or are the beds terrible Roger no, we, we are one of the early starters in town, that's for sure. OK, and listen, Roger, it has been going rather well. You're running a 42% strike rate in the last fortnight. Winners all over the place. Some big runners coming up. But let's just concentrate on 2020, Roger, if I may. Very difficult year, as you know. I seem to have been talking to all these trainers and jockeys and saying, how did you get on in 2020? But genuinely, it was a pretty big year for you, Roger. I mean, you've now had nine Royal Ascot winners. Four of them came last June in that crazy crazy period we had and you also went way over the winner mark was it record number of winners last year I think it was maybe a second best um, career tally in a year but I think considering we didn't really start till June the 1st we were you know we were very happy with how the year went and um, you know the only uh, I suppose blip, blip on the year was you know we didn't score at group one level which we you know is a big thing for us and we try and do it every year and I think in 10 years that's a, the second year we haven't done so we're, we're, we're itching to get back on the, the Group 1 scorecard but no, last year, you know, as, as a general reflection we were very happy how things went. If you look at Roger's website, it is absolutely fantastic, by the way. 17 Group 1 winners. Let's get a graphic up on the screen then for you. As ever, we do this each week. There, Here are Roger's historically best horses by Racing Post. Racing from postponed all the way down to the likes of Kate Byron, etc. Great to see Kate Byron back the other day, Roger, as well, wasn't it? And you have had many, many Group 1 winners. You've also had 10 Group 2 winners we counted on, 36 Group 3 winners as well. And we've got a big weekend coming up next week in which you hold a key in both races. Can we start talking about Third Realm, Roger? I mean, where's he come from, this chap? Well, it can happen, can't it, coming out of the winter? These horses who maybe only run once as two-year-olds. Um, he, he actually had an injury set back in the summer. Otherwise, he would have, he would have run a bit more as a two-year-old. But we got him out once, uh, once in the autumn at Kempton. He wintered very well. He, he obviously won his novice at Nottingham in good style and, and went to Lingfield and was, was very impressive in the Lingfield Derby trial. So horses can suddenly emerge um, from the winter and, and, you know, stake a claim and, you know, he looks to be one of them. Yeah, you, I mean, you must be excited about him, Roger. Uh, as viewers will be able to see on the, uh, at the Racing Post app and on the website as well, uh, David Milne's got a piece with you this week. One of the headlines of the week, he's the coolest dude in the yard. 
Sometimes you say things in, uh, and, 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 regret, <laughs> and, and regret them, don't you? Not sure that's a way to describe your Derby contender. But what I, what I meant was he's got a great mind. He's a very relaxed horse. He seems to take everything in his stride. Um, I think I was asked, you know, how he would handle uh, the occasion and, um, you know, the, the ups and downs of Epsom. And, you know, to me, obviously, he, he obviously has a big engine, but this horse, he seems to be very level, you know, and I think, um, as most trainers will uh, agree on, you know, the horse, of course, first and foremost, needs the ability. But to couple with that, they do need a good mind. They need a, a good temperament and a good attitude. And he seems to, to tick all of those boxes. I really enjoyed you talking about the way uh, that Dave Egan kept him out the headwind. And he, he he attacked quite early that day, didn't he? Of course, high rise, one in the same silks, of course, 1998 to Derby success. Was that in the back of your mind, Roger, when you took him there? or? Well, I, I discussed uh, with Sheikh Mohammed Obeid um, the horse straight after he won at Nottingham or a day or two after he won at Nottingham. And... Um, you know, we, 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 we agreed that he ought to be looking at a derby trial. The shape was very keen to go to Lingfield. And I, I thought it would be, you know, Lingfield or Chester, i.e. going, you know, the two, two derby trials covering more distance. And, um, you know, it worked well. Lingfield gave us an extra few days. And uh, obviously the result uh, was as it was. So it was a, you know, it was a good call. Mm, and he, he still looked green there, didn't he? He came over to, to, to the stand side. That was soft ground, but fast ground at Nottingham. Not bothered about the weather? Yeah, I, I don't think he's ground dependent. Um, it was pretty quick at Nottingham, although it was April. We had that real dry spell. And, you know, the guy said, uh, particularly in the home straight that day, it was really quick, probably the quickest ground we've seen this year. And although he was, you could say he was workman like that day, it was only his second career start. It was his first run of the year. But when the penny dropped, he was really strong through the line. And I, I think I said yesterday, you added a, an extra 100 yards onto that race. He had probably one by five, mm. five lengths. He was really starting to take off. He, he's not a big horse. He's, he's, he's a good moving horse. He's well balanced. He's quite economical of his action. Going to Lingfield, I was a touch worried about the soft ground, as, you know, as, as we tend to be, us trainers, we, we worry about, you know, probably most things that we shouldn't. But I thought, well, he's one on fast ground. I'm not sure he'll handle this soft ground. And he handled it very well. So I don't think we'll be too worried what ground um, we get at Epsom. Of course, I wouldn't mind it being on the soft side, knowing that he handles it. There is, of course, the Friday to consider as well, Roger. Let's just go through your Oaks runners quickly, if you don't mind. Ziada is a, is a filly that everyone is mentioning to me after something of a luckless defeat at Chester. She didn't get the greatest of... Uh, of runs, she didn't get the split when she needed one. Take nothing away from a winner. The winner won uh, very nicely and um, looks a, a very nice filly. But I think consider she carried the penalty that day, and um, I thought she travelled eye catch me well in behind. You know, Jim had to just be patient on her when the when the gaps weren't coming, and and at that time the winner sort of got away from us. But I think anyone who, who watches racing regularly could see that it was an eye catchingly good run. And uh, we feel she's come forward from that. She actually worked uh, worked uh, this morning and um, mm. we are very pleased with her. So she seems in good form, yeah. Mm. She's been an eye catcher, Chris, in almost every run she's had. I remember watching her, you know, she was unbeaten at two. If you watch back Beverly, okay, maybe not a strong race, but how she picked up that, that Mark Johnson filly, I'm not sure. Keen on her? I mean, keeping an open mind on that race, but I mean, yeah, you, anyone could see from that race, there's plenty of promise there. I guess you'd always rather, if you're taking single figure odds about a horse in a classic, you'd probably rather nothing but ones next to their name, but there's no question that she was unlucky. Mm, well, we're seeing the trends turn on their head a little bit, aren't we, on that front. What about uh, your Musadora filly, Roger? Uh, Tiona, the hood, seemingly she works well in it at home. Yeah, she sports the hood most mornings, has done... Um you know, since she was training as a two-year-old. And, um, you know, we, we hooded her to, to post at York and um, took the red hood off before she went in the gate. She got a little bit upset in the gates, miss, missed the break, raced a little bit free in behind. And, um, you know, the race didn't pan out, but we'd, we'd contemplate running her in a hood at Epsom on, on Friday. Mm, just a contemplation. She she certainly looked the filly to take out of that. I think it was a bit of a funny race, wasn't it? Stop, 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 stop. And Save a Forest is the other one we must give a mention to in the Gredley colours. Yeah, again, a lovely filly. Um, she looks the part. 
she has improved with every start and uh, she's very laid back at home. She doesn't uh, you know, give away her true ability at home, very laid back in her work, but every start there's been a, I don't know what the figures would tell you, but there's been a substantial uh, improvement, um, you know, every start she's made. And I think if she makes a similar jump from that good run at Lingfield, you know, to her next run at uh, Epsom next week, then, you know, she might surprise one or two people. Perhaps not the outsider that a lot of people expect then, Chris. Maybe not. Um, can I can I just ask Roger about El Drama, who's obviously still in the derby? I mean, one would imagine they won't both run, but but maybe Roger can confirm. That's right. El Drama's um, he's in good form, but planning to go to France at the Jockey Club. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Okay, thankfully Chris is here as well. Otherwise, that would have gone out of my mind. It's early. Let's not forget our Pat Cooney. We mentioned Royal Ascot to Roger earlier, and I know you've got a question about what might be coming up this season. Yes, I'd like to ask Roger, I mean, given his uh, tremendous record, uh, particularly at the Royal Meeting, including last year, of course, he's always a very, very popular man, particularly in the handicaps. And I was wondering if at this stage of the, the season, he has any horses that have been targeted with the Royal Ascot handicaps in mind. For example, Radeberg, I think he won well at Tahedoc recently. Would he be the type for the Britannia and so forth? And uh, at what point do you start thinking Royal Ascot will be the target for these horses? Yeah, hi, Pat. Um, well, we're thinking about Royal Ascot uh, months ago, to be honest, and um, trying to get uh, trying to get the team at least um, in the front of our minds of what uh, what might get there, what might suit uh, what race, and if we're going to get there, what um, you know, what uh, what mark gives us the best chance of winning. I think the three-year-olds, uh, you know, look pretty strong as a group this year. And uh, Rado Barg, I think, is, a, is an obvious Britannia horse. Uh, I, I thought his £11 rise was pretty steep for winning at Haydock last Saturday. I know he won nicely, but he did win on heavy ground. Heavy ground, in my experience, exaggerates distances, exaggerates performances. The majority of the field don't ha handle heavy ground. Rado Barg obviously did. And £11 puts him up to 99 Doesn't make a Britannia impossible, but maybe makes it a bit tougher. Um, you know, that would be my feeling on him. I really like the horse, but I think the handicap has given him, you know, a, a toughish uh, task. He was your 1,000th winner, of course, last Saturday, Roger. That must have been a great feeling. Yes, you know, absolutely. It's, um, you know, a good milestone to reach and, uh, and one that um, I suppose crept up on us, didn't give it an awful lot of thought. And, uh, but it's nice, nice to get there, nice, you know, nice, nice number to reach and, um, you know, uh, nice, nice for, for all the owners to recognise it. You know, the owners have been great supporters and, you know, for the, got a great team of staff working very hard here as well, you know. So I think everyone... Um, I've been the fortunate one, you know, I suppose, um, steering the ship, but uh, plenty of people have uh, contributed to that. And it's nice to recognise it, I think. But, you know, we move quickly on in this game and, um, you know, we'll push forward and try and get a few more. Yeah, absolutely. You've got a huge following out there, Roger. Really nice to hear about your big runners next weekend and, of course, some of your former favourites as well. OK, let's see what exactly is coming up on the rest of the show. We've got a hot topic for you then. We'll be looking into a No Brian's Classic and maybe first string or second string. We'll be looking at the racing clues from the past week, giving you the big race previews of the weekend, some big calls and, of course, those all-important weekend naps. Well, if you'd like to sign up to our sponsors, Bet365, now is a good time to do so because that referral code is still out there. When joining, type in SHOUT365, minimum £5 deposit for up to 100 bet credits. Terms and conditions apply. Hot topic time then, here on What A Shout This Week. Stealing a classic. Has there any it's such a thing going on. What we have seen, we're going to look into Aidan O'Brien's supposed first and second strings, third and fourth and fifth strings, as it turns out. Chris Cook, front runner email this week, gave us the lovely inspiration for this because you led the way. And there has been a bit of a trend since Serpentine. Remarkable performance in last year's derby, but then Mother Earth comes out, supposed second string, despite the fact that Frankie de Tory is on goes and does Santa Barbara, remarkable anti-post gamble, 
only fourth. And of course, then we saw last weekend at the Car Empress Josephine running down Joan of Arc. Yes. For, uh, 14 to 1, wasn't she? And that was after being back. You know, she yes. was a bigger price sort of half an hour before. Um, I, it's been a, a theme, I think, with Aidan O'Brien for quite, you know, well over a decade anyway. Um, and I, I remember the discussion used to be in the build up to the Derby. If you've got more than one Derby horse, you don't have any. The idea being that, you know, a proper Derby horse has to be so exceptional, so outstanding that, you know, there could never really be more than one in a stable. Um, and, it, you know, with Aiden, it's just completely different because, I mean, he's, he's provided with so much of the good raw material, so much of the best breeding. Um, you know, he expects to have several runners in every classic um, and they're legitimate candidates. And the market tends to focus on one, um, uh, you know, whichever one the principal jockey at the time ends up on. Um, but, you know, realistically, the others still trained by a genius um, have excellent pedigrees on the whole. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe they've been brought along quietly, but if they bloom on the day, as we just saw with Empress Josephine, or if the race pans out beautifully for them, as we saw with Serpentine last year, um, and with the other horse in the Irish Derby the year before, whose name is just a Sovereign. Season. That's the fella. They're very closely matched. I always do the Serpentine. Oh, mix man. Up. And then Santiago as well is another one word. Don't go there. Best. Yeah, it's just difficult. But, um, you know, point being, um, you know, Aidan's the first yard. Uh, I can never really remember where... Um, when he runs more than one horse in these major races, you've absolutely got to take them all seriously. Yeah. Um, but I think that the market hasn't really got into that way of thinking. I mean, we, you still see Aidan O'Brien winning classics with horses at big prices. Mm. Um, and that, that ought not really to be happening. It makes me think that, it, you know, that's as dependable a source of value um, as you're likely to find in, in modern horse racing. Well, we managed to crunch some numbers on this, Chris. Thanks to Craig Thake for doing this. He's a great numbers man at the Racing Post and the boys at Raceform Interactive as well. Rodney Patinga had a bit of that saying this. Let's get the graphic up on screen then so the viewers out there can see exactly. Now, this is since 2010. There have been 106 classics. And I remember, Chris, you said in your front runner email, you said, well, I could have gone through them all, but I imagine it would have taken a bit of time. Well, Craig Thake could do these things very, very quickly. Uh, but basically, it, in the, it, He's had 359 runners. Let me get this right. So you can see that at the bottom of the screen there. Since 2010. Now, we can only do 2010 because we've only got so much time, man, to go through this. But it's a great highlight, really. 48 winners then. Uh, and you can see, you know, look down in 2017, what a year that was. He had seven winners from 33 runners. But 29 have been favourites for a level stake profit, £1.33. 19, a whopping 19, have been outsiders as well. Some of them would, would still have been single figure odds, but uh, such as High Chaparral. Yes, exactly. Not the most fancied horse from the yard in that Derby. And you think back, you know, what High Chaparral became, you know, on a bad day, he was third in the arc. And yet, you know, he wasn't even the most fancied horse from his yard when he, when he ran in the Derby. Um, and, you know, Rocket Gibraltar, the same, you know, it was a, arguably a surprise Guineas winner, but I mean, then he sets a record for Group 1 wins in a row. Um, it's, it's just that sort of yard, um, you know, even if it seems that um, they believe Horse X is, is the better of the pair, you know, you have to look seriously at Horse Y and maybe it'll be bigger odds than it should be. Yes, and just quickly before we go to Pat and see from a bookmaking point of view how this may work out, and I'm sure you've had a few lucky escapes, Pat, looking at that. Um, next week. Yeah. So Aiden still has six in the Derby, and I suppose you know you've got to open your mind to the possibility that he's, maybe he's going to drop something else into the race on Monday. So I mean, it's, it's not like I've decided my betting strategy on the Derby or the Oaks just yet. You you sort of have to wait and see what he declares really. Um, and I think maybe even if you if you took a price early next week, you might find on the day that even if it gets into the race, it's a bigger price. So you know it's a sort of wait for the day kind of thing and yeah. see what what odds you're being offered. But personally, for my money, if you're if you're backing one of Aidens, I'd, I'd really rather be on one that's at a big price and being overlooked than the hot fav. And and you know you you're just praying it's going to justify its reputation. If you look at that graphic that we put up earlier, um, okay, so you're going to have a higher strike rate backing the obvious first strings, but quite a low percentage profit on turnover. Um, whereas if you're prepared to put up with a bit of a losing run on the other ones. Um, in the end, you're making you know a much better profit in terms, and you're going to have a bit more fun with it as well. It is absolutely just more fun to have a twenty-five to one winner than you know six to four shot scrambles won by an Austral. Yeah, those of you that followed in Mother Earth, of course, with Frankie on, and you saw her go past the Anti Post Gambler Santa Barbara. Happy days, no doubt, and Empress Empress Josephine as well. Tom Sagan in Prize Wise gave her a great mention. As Chris said, she was backed 
near the off, runs down Ryan Moore near the finish. Pat Cooney then, from a bookmaking point of view, Santa Barbara, I guess, is the obvious case to concentrate on here. 33s after winning her maiden last year, throughout the winter, all the way down. What does she go off in the classic in the end? And we know the lads, as Aidan likes to term them, Magnus, Tables, etc., uh, Smiths, everyone, they do like a bet out there, of course. How do you think? I mean, is it just tiddlywinks to these guys? Well, there's great kudos for at stud values, were they, to win. I don't suppose they get too much on, but, uh, you know, it's a bit of a best-kept secret, really, this with the uh, the perceived second and third strings. I mean, you look at the result of the Epsom Derby last year, Aiden had the winner and, of course, the third at 66-1. to 1. And that was the best flat result ever in our company's history. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it's, it's a best kept secret. Sadly, not anymore. But, um, yeah, you do look at these gambles and, they, you know, they do send out the right signals, these horses, throughout the winter. But they're very, very similar, aren't they? They're all impeccably bred and they all improve dramatically from their reappearance as well. So you, you keep saying, ah, oh, well, you know, Ryan, again, he's picked the wrong one. Probably Ryan picks the one with the best solid form book chance. Bolshoi Valley being an obvious one. Um, but you know these other horses, they do step up. But from a pricing point of view, we're not waiting with bated breath to, to see whatever Ryan rides. You go back to the two thousand guineas; that was probably a, more of a mix and match, really. That was a real conundrum: what would he ride? Uh, but a lot of people thought Battleground was the number one anyway, and that was the one Frankie ended up on. So it's a tricky one from a pricing point of view. To be honest with you, we don't pay a great deal of attention to whatever Ryan rides saying, well, he must be the definitive number one. It's just not that straightforward. I mean, Aiden will run three or four, as we've touched on in the race, and jockey bookings are interested. And, of course, now you throw in Frankie de Tory riding a lot more for the stable. So it's not beyond the realms of impossibility that Frankie's on high definition. And from a, a, a liability point of view on the day, high definition is going to be just as bad a result as Bolshoi Ballet. But, uh, yeah, beware the not just the second string, the third or fourth string. They, that's, uh, it has been very beneficial to us over recent years. Mm, so there you go. I really enjoyed that. That was the hot topic. And stealing a classic. I'm sure you enjoyed that out there as well, of course, unless you've steamed into Bolshoi Ballet. And now you're thinking, hang on a minute, I better cover the book. Let's have a look at some racing clues from you. Classic time again. Testing, testing. One, two is what we should be headlining here because it was a case of one, two on the Saturday and a one, two on the Sunday. We've got to go to the car. Of course, Jim Bulger does it again. He's back. Another renaissance. How many renaissances can you have, for goodness sake? But McSwiney, who looked disappointing in the yeah. Downstown, a derby trial, comes out against Poetic Flair, the 2000 Guineas winner. Kevin Manning, of course, can't get off a classic winner. Runs an absolute blinder. McSwiney comes and chins him. And McSwiney, he, he, he's getting that reputation, isn't he, of a real battler? Yeah, I mean, you know that old thing about, you know, some trainers get their horses to sort of uh, almost uh, adopt their characteristics. So, like, Mark Johnson are just really cussed animals that will not be passed because they're so determined. And there's a kind of a toughness that, that Jim Bolger's putting into some of his horses. I mean, you know, maybe this is just in my head. But I mean, Max Sweeney, um, he had a nasal discharge, didn't he? He had some sort of infection yes. going on, which is why he didn't run his race at Leperstown. Um, and he's got over that with maybe a week to spare before coming out and winning the Irish Guineas. And that's amazing on, you know, sopping ground. I, I guess the ground is in his favour because he won a group one, didn't he, as a juvenile on that kind of ground at yeah. Donny. Um, yes. But, I mean, what a tough animal. And then, you know, the same goes for the runner-up because that was his third European classic in the space of about three weeks. Yes, because he, he ran, uh, you know, of course, a long shot, didn't he, mm. uh, the other week before. Form-wise, two coming clear, yes. stable mates of Van Gogh, who was... Have I pronounced that right? This is one of the worst pronunciations you ever I'll accept it. Well, you is that acceptable? Yes. If the front runner accepts it, I'm, I'm happy with that. <laughs> yeah. the, the third horse, who was the best of the Aidan O'Brien battalion, shall we say. Wembley just doesn't look like he's trained on, does he? Yeah, it looks that way, speaking of somebody who backed him at Newmarket. Yeah, and um, somebody who, who, who kept him on side of the car as well, thinking he'd go on the heavy ground. But weak in the market, wasn't he? Form-wise? Well, I, I think it's worth taking a positive view of the first two. Um, then the question is, you know, how quickly would you like to see them back on a race course? I mean, anyway, it looks like Max Sweeney's going to Epsom next week and he really will have to be tough to run another big race there. But, I mean, you know, coming from that yard, you, you wouldn't bet against it. New approach, etc. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Daddy. Absolutely. Do you know, oh God, I was so certain that New Approach couldn't win the derby because he was, he was a bit of a puller, wasn't he? Um, I, I think I laid him for a place in the end. And he so, wasn't quite a dawn approach, of course, pulled his head off. It wasn't, wasn't as bad, but I mean, he was still sort of in that direction. And I was watching up in the downs, you know, standing by the rail, 
after they'd gone about six furlongs and he went past me buried in the pack pulling his head off I thought, ha, 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 that won't win yeah, and he's this just flash of green pretty much makes all doesn't it yeah oh, yeah, man. yeah so it, it, it's the approaches and it's a difficult approach as well but pat cooney uh, we also saw the one two on sunday as well we t- touched on that of course in the hot topic uh mcswiney he was backed yeah, there was money around for him, and I, I suppose he'd won on uh, testing ground as a juvenile. And we would we were scratching around, weren't we, trying to find horses that would go on the ground and uh, and enter him. I mean, the Jessica Harrington horse that went a favourite. We were all a little bit uh, against that one with stamina issues and so forth. So you could make a, a, a case out for him at a price, and uh, there was a few quid around for him. And he, he won well enough, I thought. Whether that is Derby winning form remains to be seen. But as as Chris, as Chris says, that uh, this is Jim Bolger. If, if he decides he's going to Epsom next, then we should all sit up and pay attention. Um, it's not an ideal preparation. I have such a tough race, I wouldn't have thought so near Epsom. But uh, this is a tough horse with a tough trainer. There's lots to talk about from the car, of course. The Tats Gold Cup, of course. Uh, Broom getting run down, of course, in line by Helvick Dream. Price Wise fans in Clover there. Uh, I thought Broom had a big race in that. You know, he tacked a long way out, didn't he? Probably wants mile four now. Yeah, I mean, he's just, you don't think of him as quite being up to group one quality in the end. Um, and I, I don't think that was the best version of the Tattersall's Gold Cup that we've ever seen. Mm. Shame no British horses, actually, because, I mean, that's that's maybe, you know, one of the very rare top-class Irish races that we have a halfway decent record in. A very good record. Uh, that was something else you four, touched on last Four out of the last eight, I think, before, yeah. well, before this weekend's running. And that it, restrictions aside, that's still a bit surprising that we didn't see one go over. I mean, yeah. a Glen Shield ran on the you know on the card on the Saturday, for example. Didn't it? These days, you have to be pretty brave as a British-based trainer to go over to Ireland at all. But um, you know, and I guess nobody felt that they had the right horse at the stage of the season. I guess that's it. We were hoping a Dave might do it, but it's all about the getting over Australia, I suppose, for him. Um, did you see the Marble Hill Stakes, Castle Star? I did not. It was. I tell you what, watch it back. It was okay. nearly going to be one of my. Big calls this. The Marble Hill, a two-year-old race over six furlongs, won by uh, a Caravaggio before commentary success, Power before commentary success, Ballydoll nowhere. They ran something called the Entertainer. This for Fozzie Stack and Tommy Stack looks like a serious two-year-old. Watch back your replay. Watch the grin of Chris Hayes as he goes past the line. It's his third run, but he's going to take some beating in you know, the commentary, I think, as he comes out. He's a very, very nice horse. Pat Cooney, we also had Haydock. Liberty Beach came back in the Temple Stakes. Yeah, the Mighty Liberty Beach. Uh, yeah, disappointing race, that one really, wasn't it? We were looking for the uh, the southern base runners, weren't we? I think five of the six were all uh, uh, trained up in Yorkshire. So it, it was it was a race that uh, was certainly very winnable, uh, but she turned up, she delivered, she won by an X, she goes on the ground. Very likeable run, yeah. And of course, the, the, the other, I suppose, shock result was uh, Rohan winning half an hour earlier in the Sandy Lane at 33 to 1 for uh, Dave Evans, Shane Kelly. And I think the runner-up came out of the race with a great deal of credit. Dragon Symbol. We mm. we were worried about this one on the ground, weren't we? But he only got beat uh, a nose. So he hasn't uh, done his Commonwealth Cup prospects any harm at all. He's probably going to be better on fast ground. But Rohan, I thought, is uh, you know probably, the, you could argue, he's the most improved horse in training. Uh, and the mo- most horse improved, most improved horse in training. Get it out, man. And yet not able to run in the Commonwealth Cup. Because Gilded, yes. What do you uh, make of that then? Come on. Well, I mean, Lee Moss said obviously said in the paper that it was ridiculous and snooty and what an uptight sport we are. I, I um, don't go all the way with him there because I, I accept the need for... It's a stallion's um, race to a certain extent. Exactly. You need certain races that are, are just going to sort of flag up yeah. who the best prospects are you know, that can go to stud. And, and there is a competitive advantage, isn't there? If you geld a horse, you make it more biddable. It's just easier to manage, easier to yeah. train. In theory, I guess. I never, never actually trained one, gelding or not. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, that's supposed to be part of the reason why you do it. And so I, I can see the sense in restricting mm. a race like the Commonwealth Cup to entires. We have also had, we are on, a will filming on Friday, and we also had the previous night what's thought to be the best midweek card, the Brigadier Gerard yeah. card. It looked all about the grounds for me, Chris. And about you. Yeah, I mean, well, there's been a lot about that about in the last couple of weeks, and I think maybe again this weekend. Hopefully, by the time you get into next week, we'll get some sort of proper summer ground. But um, mm. but yeah, it, it's Sandown, you know what Sandown is like. It, it doesn't drain all that quickly. It can be a real test. And with that uphill finish, there was, there was only so many horses that were really going on it. And just when you thought the pain was over, um, over comes Henry de Bromhead to steal yet another big prize. I and mean, the next smart press got a filly called Lismore, who took out 
you know, the big staying race, that was a remarkable performance under Jamie Spencer. I should think at the time they sold that for 60 grand, they were thinking they'd done a pretty good bit of business. And then, well, hold on. <laughs> we'll she just, just didn't off. jump or something, but Henry came over and, and, and nicked the prize. Not in the Gold Cup, but we'll be looking to the CAD round and races like that. Won right. by another remarkably progressive filly last year, Princess Zoe. So, Yeah, there were plenty of races around and, and good value in some of those staying races these days. Mm. Um, Henry walking on water then again. Uh, I wonder if he'll be looking at Royal Ascot runners now. Well, I mean, yeah, the, in fairness, there's that um, two and a half mile handicap is on day one yeah, where the jump strainers are always heavily involved. I mean, you know, any flat race where proper stamina is required, you find that you know, there are jump strainers getting involved. And I'm sure there's a reason for it. You know, they're just, that's the way they operate is they get these horses to stay. Rise smile at Heath House with some Mark Prescott, I think, having let that one go. Um, and there was also the Brigadier Gerald Stakes itself, a depleted field, a little bit disappointing that we didn't have an outright Group 1 horse, probably down to the ground. Yeah, I would think so. Um, and, uh, I mean, I th there's always been hopes for Sangarius at one time or another. Oh. Uh, it, it would be two years ago now that he won at Royal Ascot. And, again, that was on soft ground. Um, but you start finishing so powerfully and having cruised through the race and you think, well, what's this going to go on and be? Were you surprised that he made the running on Sangarius? He... I was, well, I was shocked and disappointed and, you know, in the end inclined to blame that for the fact that he got beat. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, when you watch the race and he goes off in front, which is a surprise, and it looks as though he's being ridden to beat Extra Elusive, I guess you can understand that. But meanwhile, you can glance, you know, out the back. You know, which probably exactly the, the soft right ground to lover be. in the pack, of course. Uh, and he comes over towards the stand side in the home straight, um, yes. where the others stay sort of out in the middle and floundering. And I mean, it's, it's you know great. It made a lot of people very happy to see a veteran like him um, winning a nice prize like that. Yeah, and, and taking best. it back to Scotland, go on Scotland. But, well, there um, we are. A career but, best for Jim Goldie at eight. There's hope for all of us, isn't there? And uh, a rare piece of pocket talking from the front runner not, there. Not rare you're, at all. You're human like the rest <laughs> of us. Absolutely. That was last week's racing clues. Let's get in to the first of the big brace previews this weekend. Up to Haydock we go again on a Saturday. It's drying out there, but you have to think the ground's going to be on the tacky side. Will that inconvenience the brilliant El Astronaute, Pat Cooney, in the Achilles stakes? Well, yes, uh, he's an easy horse to make favourite, really, isn't he? won this race last year. I, I've got a reservation, really, about the Chester run. I, he just absolutely exploded out of the traps, didn't he, when he won last uh, last time at uh, Chester. He beat Kings Lynn that day. Uh, and I think it was thanks to the excellent break that he made. Now, that's at Chester. You're on the turn straight away. So he did pinch it that day, a la Serpentine in the derby. This is going to be that bit harder tomorrow for him. That's why he's his favourite, albeit 7-2. to two. Kings Lynn is back in opposition against him. I keep waiting for this horse. He's pretty much a notebook horse, but I, I, I see good rather than bad. I mean, the honeymoon's going to be near enough over with this fella soon if he doesn't start winning for me because he's got so much ability. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt this time around. The Royal Runner, ridden by Oshin Murphy. I think Haydock will suit him better than Chester. And I don't think the favourite, El Astronaute, will get that B of the bang start again this time around in this big field. So I'm keeping the faith with Kings Lynn, but the honeymoon's nearly over. Well, I don't think you'll be alone out there, Pat, with Kings Lynn. He, I don't know. He's, he's, he's becoming one of them, I think, isn't he, Chris? But something Pat said there, they, they, our viewers will be aghast about. Let us know on YouTube. He stole the race at Chester. Uh, El Astronaute. Does yeah. El Astronaute ever steal a race? I, I don't know about steal. He, he was perfectly suited to the race. He's just uh, ping the, and go. He's the catchy yeah. of, you know, Chester is just Wouldn't perfect. hold it against him at all. But, I mean, you know, it, it did work out nicely for him. Uh, yeah. And, you know, at the end, you sort of felt like he, he didn't want to go much further, like another 10 yards. He might have been passed. Um, and, you know, the problem with Kings Lynn is he, he's actually worse off at the weights this time. But I still think I'm going to end up backing him. He, he was like 11 to 10. Are you to, going in for Kings Lynn? Yes. Lynn's? Why not? Uh, he, was, he was 11 to 10 to beat Astronauti that day. Um, and now you can get six to one, and the other one's five. Uh, I think El Astronauti is getting competition for the lead um, because our Nate's in the race, and yes. maybe one or two others that, that go forwards. Um, so, you know, by the end of the five furlongs on this um, testing surface that we expect it's going to be, they're going to be blowing bubbles, aren't they? And, you know, here comes Kingsland to go past and win. Pat Cooney and, and Chris Cook, a forgiving nature, which is some well, of the not, best. Well, not after this race. Well, if, perhaps if it doesn't not go right now. There, there, there comes a cliff, doesn't there, at some point. Uh, you know, you're braver than I am. I'm taking a flyer in this. You mentioned the pace. I thought Tarbush might have a chance uh, for Paul Midgey, but he, he, he tends to take a few runs to, yes, to uh, bump up, doesn't exactly he? exactly what I was thinking. Yes. He might be a little early might in the be season. An, uh, August, September type, mightn't he? Exactly. So that's
that's what we think about Tarbush. Ishvara for Robert Cal. We still call it the Sprint King, Robert? Sure. It was a label that he got, wasn't it, very much, because it, it remarkable improvement these sprinters he had. Um, and Ishvara is a course and distance winner. She likes soft ground. She's got Aussie Tom on. Tom the Pom, as you called him. Well, oh, brilliant. There's a new label for you. And I don't think it's new, but... Well, I, okay. I first time I heard it. I think it was bat as well, which I think is, is great. It's an eye-catching jockey book, but the most important thing for me is she's drawn very close to El Astronaute. Right. And I think with Tarbush and a couple on the other side, I just think she's going to get the run of the race. And 25 to 1-ish, as she was at the time recording with Bet365, is big. Yeah, it is pretty big. I'm persuaded about that. Oh, there we go. Happy days. All right. We can agree occasionally here <laughs> on What a Shout. Let's go to Haydock then again for another big race preview. Roger Varian's got a key runner in this, Pat Cooney. It's the Pinnacle Stakes. What price, Caballetta, has she been in the market? Well, she's a solid favourite at the moment. She trades around about a six to four chance. And on official ratings, I think Oriental Music is narrowly in front of her. But Cavaletto, she's got a, you know, a good profile overall. I suppose the interesting thing about her, she wears blinkers first time. So um, maybe we'll see significant improvement as a result of that. But her overall CV reads ever so well. And um, I would imagine she'll take a deal of eating here. Mm, let's go to Roger Varian then. You've got Caballetta in here, Roger. I guess on her best form, you'd have to be very hopeful that this prize will be coming your way again. You've won it twice in the last 10 years. First time blinkers go on. Yeah, um, Caballetta, she's a lovely filly and uh, she did well last year. We, we've actually been thrilled with her at home throughout the spring, has been working um, really well. Went to York for the Middleton Stakes, um, albeit knowing it was probably a touch under her best trip. We were all just a little disappointed, but she came off a bridal early that day. And um, although she was a third and it reads very well, I thought she was quite a, um, quite a well-beaten third. Mm. And um, I don't think that her run measured up to the signs she had been given us at home. Um, I think uh, in conversation with Chris Richardson, who, who manages Sheely Park Stud, and uh, I think he pointed out one of her siblings had improved markedly for headgear. And, um, you know, we so we considered playing around with it. And she's sported blinkers uh, for four or five days at home over the last two weeks and has uh, adapted to them very well. And, and I'm not for one minute suggesting she's an ungenuine filly. I think she's very genuine, but it might just give her a little bit more focus. And um, if she was lacking focus at York, hopefully she won't be at Haydock on Saturday. I, I think she's OK on the what's likely to be sort of soft, dead ground. I think she'll be OK on that. The mile and a half, I do believe, is her best trip. And um, I think if she can just take a little step forward from York, but more importantly, transfer some of that good homework to the race course, then yes, I hope uh, she takes a beating. Mm, I think she will, Roger. Back up and trim. You've answered my question about the ground as well. Chris Cook, where do you see it going? Yeah, I think Cabaletta looks the solid option. I started by thinking, remembering that run at Newbury last summer, that she might be better with a sounder surface. Um, but, you know, there's sort of evidence pointing both ways. And the reality is you'd have a similar concern about most of the runners in the race. Um, so I end up thinking that, you know, even if she does run a little bit below her best, it still might be OK for this in this race. Well... Thank you to Roger Varian for coming on. Roger, I know you've given us your precious time. The sun is shining in Newmarket. All is well. Congratulations again on your 1,000th win. That hoodoo's off your back now. You can go and get 2,000 before you know it. And good luck for the rest of the week. A big week next week. We're wishing you well. Thank you, Dave. Thanks very much. Marvellous, wasn't it, to have Roger Varian on with us then here on this week's What a Shout. Big calls for you this weekend. Going to really enjoy this one. Pat Cooney, I'll let you take the floor. Yeah, uh, I thought it was an interesting uh, scenario last night. There was a, at Sandown on the Thursday. This is a history writer trained by a friend of the show, David Manoussier, was a big gamble. And, of course, David Manoussier, uh, he's got a tremendous record around Sandown for whatever reason. Anyway, he had a horse running last night called History Writer. Bit of an in-and-out type of horse, but capable of winning on his day. Anyway, he finished last of 10. Disappointing, testing ground. We move on, so we think. But he has an account on Twitter. And he did tweet after the race, is a tricky customer. We've all lived to know this since he set foot on the race course. He ran too keen and therefore didn't breathe properly as a consequence and wasn't able to see out the race. And I thought, fair play him. We're all scratching our head wondering why he ran so badly. Mm. There's the trainer coming on after the race on Twitter, not just saying, hi, hi, we've had a winner, but he's finished last of 10. I wouldn't have felt like talking or certainly not going on Twitter to, to, to speak to anybody after the race. But David Manusa, is this the sort of modern attitude 
that we should all be lauding um, and respected. I thought it was a nice touch from him. I say we can all we can all sing when we're winning. We're, when we're last to 10, that's a different scenario. But fair play to him coming on after the race and just letting us know. Yeah, and I think racing Twitter, as we call it, did enjoy that. Um, maybe not some. Uh, David later on in the thread of that said, you know, I've only had two keyboard warriors saying pretty horrible things about me on social media. I've had worse. But it was a well back favour. I mean, slammed, actually. Uh, Paul Keeley back on the race course last night at Sandown. That was one of his two pointers. It was all going well I'm until then. He's We've not heard from him. There's been no <laughs> word since. He's probably on some bins in Isha somewhere. I don't know. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, but that is a nice touch and something we're starting to see a bit more of. Last week on the show, we had uh, George Bowie. Very socially aware. Yeah, it's just the, the way the game is going. Um, you know, the, the younger trainers, they've been raised with this, haven't they? The, the awareness of it, you know. Um, when you see sort of some older guys like Nicky Henderson paying attention to what's happening on Twitter and so on, you know, that's, that's a bit of an eye-opener. But, I mean, for the younger guys, it's just it's easier. It's part of life. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, it's great to see somebody who actually wants to sort of communicate and get their point across um, and, you know, have the performances of their horses to be understood. Yeah, he's a lovely character, David. And, uh, and as Pat said, a, a friend of the show. David, when you're retweeting this, let us know when you want to come back on when your big star filly comes out. He's just philosophical about it, and not every horse is going to run its race. And, and, and actually, the analysis of the race as well was was it was nice to see, wasn't it? So yeah, and I mean, I think broadly speaking, most racing fans understand that. And you know, if you're prepared to sort of come out and be open and say, "Well, look, you know, I'm a bit gutted, but but we think this is the reason." People love you for that. The best thing about that was I analysed that race in the paper and he pretty much tweeted what I'd written. And, and let me let me tell you, I've not always agreed with David when it comes to analysis and then him retweeting my work. So that was absolutely peach. Um, Chris Cook, what have you got Aye. for us? So uh, is this the beginning of the end for the whip? That, that would be my... Uh, Here we it's, go. It's a bit of a rhetorical question, really, because I don't think it is the beginning of the end of the whip. But um, it's just it's so interesting that um, Monmouth Park in uh, New Jersey in the US... Um, by state law, uh, they are not allowed to use the whip for encouragement um, of racehorses. Starting today, you know, the, the racing returns to Monmouth for the summer season mm. um, and the jockeys will still be carrying whips because, you know, they have to have them in case, uh, you know, it, there's a safety need, um, you know, if you're riding a willful animal and if it's going to do something that's potentially dangerous to itself or to others, you need that whip there to, to correct it. Um, but you, you're not allowed to use the whip in the middle of a race to encourage your horse to go faster. Um, and so it, it, from our perspective, it's, it's like Monmouth has suddenly become a, a giant experiment, you know, or a long experiment over the summer to see what whip-free racing um, could look like. I mean, they'll have some good quality, valuable races there, um, you know, in, involving some, you know, quite good quality horses. Um, and we'll, ha we'll get to see, uh, you know, what racing would look like if you weren't allowed to use the whip in that way. And if, if it works, clearly that is going to spread pretty quickly. Um, you know, my suspicion is that it may, might have, a, you know, my fear, like all of us, is that it might have a very different look. Um, mm. I think particularly, you know, when you're talking about racing on, on dirt um, or, you know, on soft turf here, um, you, you might need the whip to sort of keep encouraging your horse you forward. You a lot of slaps, don't you, when there's a bit of slop yeah. underfoot, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean... You, People talk about the whip in this country, the, the pro kush it's called, the design of it. Um, you know, it's clearly been engineered over a very long period of time um, so that it doesn't hurt the horse. You know, we believe that it doesn't. You know, the horse can't talk to you, obviously. Um, we certainly hope that's true. Um, but I think if if it ended up that the participants in racing and the fans of racing um, could live with this sort of new version that they're going to have at Monmouth Park, you know, whip-free racing, then clearly that is going to spread across the US and elsewhere. Uh, elsewhere is interesting because Racing Victoria in Australia, um, that's Melbourne basically, they've been trying to make the case for the whole of Australia being whips shall be carried and not used. So all of a sudden we're hands and heels racing, aren't we, basically, as we know it over here? Well, uh, exactly. No, you wouldn't think that hands and heels races that we do have in this country, people are not so wildly enamoured with that kind of racing that they want to see in the Derby, for example, or in the best races at Royal Ascot. You know, we still have that culture where we believe you need the whip to have sort of top quality, most competitive horse racing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so I'm, I'm glad this isn't happening at a, a track where, you know, I particularly love watching the action and, and would want to bet on it. I, I, 
you know, I believe they're very worried that punters will be put off and will not want to bet on this, uh, at least until it settles down and they can get a handle on how the form is going to work out. So, um, jockeys are very upset about it. Trainers are worried that because the jockeys aren't going to ride there, they're not going to have access to the best riding talent. Um, so there's a lot of fear, but at the end of it all, these races are going to take place and we'll get to see what happens. So, you know, maybe let's look at it with an open mind and see what we think. So you'll be keeping a beady front running eye on that for us. Definitely. I think, I think all of a sudden Sky just got a lot of viewers at Monmouth and just, that they weren't expecting as well. Yeah, maybe we should be watching more US racing anyway. We should broaden our horizons, shouldn't we? It's out there, isn't it? Okay, so we will keep an eye on that. A couple of questions already. A lot of people will be aghast out there. Talking about being aghast, mention Racing Victoria. Did anyone read the, the, the ridiculous statement from Peter Moody this week? about Zaki. You remember the great Zaki? I call him the great Zaki, which have now is, is what they think he is down under. This was a group two at best horse for Sir Michael Stout. Zaki, can we call him that, Chris? Yeah, I guess that's fair, yeah. I mean, he, he sometimes promised to be a bit better than that, but yes. it didn't quite work. So Zaki goes down under, joins a British trainer called Annabelle Nisham, British trainer, going down under, and wins a provincial group one. They have a lot of them down there. I think Peter Moody himself is a 56-time grade one winning trainer. Black caviar, of course. Remember the greatest sprinter pretty much they've ever trained, came up here, took out our Diamond Jubilee, just. Uh, he came out in the week uh, and said, Australian trainers are a lot better than the, our European counterparts. Uh, Sir Michael Stout in particular must have had a wry smile about this, I would imagine. It's a ridiculous statement, basically. Uh, and if you look at the figures, when he won that listed race, we gave him a race post rating of 117. Guess what he got when he took apart this group one down under the other week, Chris? 117. Get in. So Peter it's Moody not looking at the figures. Now, obviously, the Aussies like to stir it up a bit, don't they? But with all the new restrictions with the Melbourne Cup, this is starting to become a little bit fierce, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it read to me like he sort of talked his way um, bravely in, in, into saying the brave statements at the end of his piece. So I think, I guess he's been egged on by whoever else is in the conversation. He starts out being relatively cautious and just gets more bold as it goes <laughs> well, on. I certainly did that. I wonder whether I should dignify it in a big call, but I thought I'd stick up for Sir Michael Stout anyway. And uh, do they have too many group ones down in Australia? They probably do, don't they? They were your big calls. Let's go to Beverly, shall we? Big day for them on Saturday. And the 3.10 is the condition stakes for two-year-olds. And Pat Cooney, I need some help with this, I must say. Uh, this looked like a tricky part one to me, and I wasn't sure about the favourite. Yeah, this is intriguing, isn't it? And it is the first time we've actually sponsored at Beverly, so looking forward to that tomorrow. And this is an interesting race, isn't it? It's just the six runners. Favourite at the moment is Ryan's Party. Why is he favourite? Well, there was loads of money for him when he made his debut and he finished second. He was a little bit unlucky. He fluffed his lines at the start. He got beat a length by Tipperary Sunset, who reopposes uh, on Saturday. He's four pound better off. So he was easy to make favourite. I don't know how high class that form is by any means, but um, he did enough to suggest he, he should reverse the form at any rate. Um, but there's an interesting newcomer in the race, Straits of mm. Moore, who we've put in as second favourite. Unraced Richard Fahey, and Richard Fahey's got loads and loads of two-year-olds. So the fact that he's starting this one off in a class two is a little bit interesting. He's unraced, but his sire is Prince of Lear, who amazingly won this race before when uh, when he was a juvenile. So you'd imagine this fella's pretty nippy. Whether the testing ground uh, he'll get home or not remains to be seen. An intriguing race. I wouldn't draw a line through any of these at all. When you think the outside of the race is, is a Richard Hannon juvenile. So uh, you can make a case out for them all. Ryan's party, though, just about favourite on the bases. He went in a fair few notebooks after his promising debut. I was just a bit surprised he was as short as he was with you at the time when I looked at this. Straits of Moyle, then, as Pat mentioned, Prince of Lear, the sire, won this race for the Cool Silk Partnership, who races on the banner of, of course, this is the same ownership. So yeah. a plot we might have <laughs> stumbled upon there. He looked the interesting one to my eye. Uh, I mean, I guess he's interesting because, you know, he's a complete unknown quantity, isn't he? But yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't make me feel like I want to back, back him. Um, I mean, I thought Rob John, the, the Richard Hannon one, which is the outsider. I mean, because if you look at the, um, the ratings, what the horses that have raced so far 
have achieved is, is kind of similar. Heavy ground at Beverly is, is what we're forecast to get. Um, and so, that, you know, for two-year-olds, that can be really demanding, especially, I think, for a first time out two-year-old to be faced with that. It's a lot to ask. So really what you're looking for is the horse that's going to get home in these conditions. And I, yeah, I think Rob John looks to me like the most likely candidate. I mean, both his races so far have been just over a smidge further than this. Um, last time out at York, um, on soft ground, he's carrying a penalty because he already won the race at Brighton. Um, and he's a decent, promising winner, um, but he's run on quite nicely into second place. And I can see him finishing best of all of these. What's interesting is, you know, jockey-wise, um, John Fahey's ridden him the first two times he's run. Um, you know, John, perfectly capable, but he hasn't had that many sort of potential winning rides over the years. I think this one is his only winner since 2019. Wow. Um, Sean Levy on board for the first time this weekend. Um, and you know, with all respect you know, to John, that you'd think that's a sort of an upgrade. Um, we'll see, you know, if maybe he'll be ridden a little bit more aggressively. Um, in complete I, agreement. When you see Sean Levy next to his name, you're, you're certainly not put yeah. off at all, are you? So No, uh, yeah, I, that's... He's a definite positive, yeah. Considering, you know, that yard has such a great reputation for its juveniles, um, and that they progress for their first two, three, four runs, maybe even. Um, I think he's he's being underestimated by the backing. And so I'm going against it. All the principles I have, first time out rules do apply, but it'll be straight some more for me. Chris Cook might be talking a little bit more sense. John Gaunt Stakes comes next in 3.30. The last of the big race previews for us this weekend. Back up to Haydock we go. Now this is for the sort of what we call twilight horses or often horses that are unexposed moving up through the ranks or something coming out of Handicap Company. They have a great chance to win a big Saturday race. And we've mentioned El Astronorte, of course, in the sizzling Achilles stakes. This has got a remarkably similar profile, Safe Voyage, the wonderful Safe Voyage, same colours, of course, same sort of age and same sort of win ratio. Yeah, well, wouldn't you love to own a horse like Safe Voyage? I mean, so game. And of course, it was at Haydock, was it two years ago, where he just sort of went up through the ranks, sort of handicap listed. Right. Yep. And then he's sort of mixing it in top class company on occasion these days um, and doing pretty well. Um, He's the Bristol Demai of, of flat racing, isn't he? In that he just absolutely loves Haydock. Well, now you say that, that that's kind of damning with a faint praise well, on Bristol Demai. <laughs> Let's not get into that one. Does he win? Um, yeah, I mean, he might do. The, the, the lock and run was disappointing, even, you know, allowing for the fact that, you know, nobody really expects him to beat Palace Pier. Yeah. And maybe the ground wasn't quite right for him, but he was, he was still, unfancied in the market, was he? Still last, mm. you know, and it's only two weeks later. Um, I, I, if I was backing my short price now, I'd, I'd want to see a little bit better that that day. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, you know, Brad the Brief looks a bit more tempting at a bigger oh. price, 16 to 1. Um, I mean, it, it went a bit wrong at the car last time when they stepped him up to 7, but I think he, he does look like a 7 furlong horse in the making. And soft ground is absolutely no problem. Um, you know, Tom Dasker, who's Mr. Haydock, isn't he? I was just looking through his stats again last night to make sure I wasn't talking nonsense. But I mean, he's won the like Bristol a... Demire of the training race. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. He's won like 116 races at Haydock and yeah. 66. Him at and Chester. Richard King's got there under the Kings of Haydock. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think any horse that goes there um, for them, you have to take it real seriously. And, and this one, um, because of the, you know, the last day when he was beaten properly, I think he's not being taken all that seriously. But you look at his form last year on soft ground over six, there are a couple of races where he's finishing really strongly. Um, and I think it might be uh, seven furlong doing him a favour this time. Mm. With thanks is interesting, isn't it? For Haggis and Tom, uh, Pom, of course. Tom the Pom, uh, uh, Tom Marquand. Uh, she's in the Duke of Cambridge. She looks very interesting. She was touched off last year on her return at Thirsk. I'll watch that back. Perhaps she might ought to have won that race, I think. But she's interesting. She won't have any problems with the ground. But first time out winners in this are thin on the ground. Is that right? Well, I mean, you wouldn't know where the, the top of her ability is. Um, yeah. But uh, you, she's been well found in the market. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? And that's what led me to look at Njord for Jesse Harrington, Balmoral winner on really bad ground. And we spoke to Jesse Harrington, as our viewers will remember, a couple of weeks ago. What a pleasure that was. And uh, I asked the secretary earlier in the week, would Njord be running in the Victoria Cup? And well, we're looking at something else. And I oh, just got the feeling it was a solid run last time that this is comeback run okay, better this time, third time peak fitness. Njord for me with no ground worries. I think Shane Foley coming over. I'd have to worry about Irish Raiders, you know, in any <laughs> circumstances these yes. days. Indeed, no Henry here, but Jesse coming to Plundo. Pat Cooney, give us some help. Well, safe voyages favourite at the moment. You'd have to say it's, you know, it's a bit of a flaky looking favourite. Yes, he won the race last year. 
Yes, he likes the ground. Yes, he likes the track. Last of 11, last time out. Prior to that, well, let's have a look at his run up before that. Last of 14. But they were, they were group ones and grade ones in uh, the Breeders' Cup and in the Lockinge. We can give him a pass. He wins group two races. This is a group three, but he has that five pound penalty. I think he's opposable with Banks. Again, you're not sure where she is. This is ripe, really, for a result, isn't it? This is one where you can just look at the front couple in the market and go, yeah, maybe if, if they win, so be it. My eye is drawn to Kin Ross. Now, this is another uh, notebook course for me. When he won first time out as a two-year-old at Newmarket, I actually backed him for the 2,000 guineas the following day. Wow. I thought he looked like Pegasus. Uh, it hasn't worked out for him. He's been gelded since. This is his first run since being gelded. He's about a 9-10 to 1 chance, and he's got Frankie Dettori aboard. Gelded, goes on the ground, Frankie. I'd rather be playing him at 10 than Safe Voyage at 3. That was like confessions of Cooney, wasn't it? I backed Kin Ross in the guineas. You know, and I heard a wow coming from Chris Cook. And let me tell you, probably from you out there as well. It's one of those races, isn't it? The John O'Gorn. What a great named race it is. We've tried to give you some help. Get your questions in below for the panel and let us know what wins this Group 3. Time for the My Racing Double then. Do check out MyRacing.com. They've got a huge Twitter following, expert tips and analysis for you, and they love to give us a double each week, and it is at Haydock. Henry Candy, they think, will take out the pinnacle stakes with La Lune, and straight following on from that, a first-time outer. They're not worried about fitness with With Thanks from the Haggis Yard. Weekend winner time here on What A Shout For You. This is the bit that I know a lot of you have been waiting for all show. And at 3.50 at Chester, I'll kick off with a horse called Blow Your Horn. Jamie Spencer got a great tune out of this last couple of times at Chelmsford. But he's lightly raced. He's still going forward. Don't think he'll have a problem with the ground. He stays all day. This is a horse that might yet just get into one of those big staying handicaps later on in the season for Charlie Fellows. He knows how to train a stayer or two, doesn't he? Chris Cook, give us a nap. So uh, Rob John, um, not because you could be completely confident that it's going to work out for him, but just because that's the biggest difference between the price that he is and the price I was expecting or, or think he should be. Um, but also I'm going to be having a very close look at anything that Rod Millman runs um, over the weekend and maybe even beyond because, you know, he is hot, hot, hot. Um, five wins from the last nine. Um, I gave him a mention in the front runner this morning, um, having to leave out the, the one from Sandown last night. Um, and didn't it go and win at 9 Cool cats. Um, I, I, of course, I didn't have a penny on. Um, but it, it looks like, you know, he's he's obviously, you know, he's well aware now that his yard is flying and his horses are at the peak of their ability. And, um, he's got eight horses entered for Saturday, including Ooh. a lot at Salisbury. Um, so I haven't figured out exactly which one or two or three I'm going to be going with, but I should be giving them all a very close look. Rob Millman, soft ground, Salisbury, they go hand in hand, don't they? And it's not like these are the horses that have been winning already. You know, these are oh. horses that have maybe had one run so far. And, you know, you'd think looking at their profile, they might be ready to go in so again. So Rob John, have a bit of fun with Rob Millman at Salisbury. Brilliant. It's Thank fun. you, Chris Cook, for your winners. OK, Pat Cooney, complete the treble. Yeah, I'm off to Beverly, absolutely off to Beverly. We sponsor the card there tomorrow, so I'm uh, looking forward to a nice day out. And I'm going to look in the 235 there, and number nine, Widad, trained by George Bowie, um, very capable trainer. Um, this horse ran the other day over 10 furlongs, maybe didn't quite stay, dropping down to a mile and half a furlong tomorrow, goes on the ground, trip ideal, Nicola Curry of a board, she's won on the horse before. George Bowie turning the horse out after two days, he must be happy with this one's uh, credentials. And she is there, bottom weight, uh, George Bowie, bottom weight in a, in a handicap. Just got a, a good, solid overall looking profile for me. So we're dad in the 235 at Beverly. Yeah, certainly caught my eye as well for last week's guest on the show. There were your weekend winners. There you go then, Roger Varian. That was absolutely superb this week for you out there. Hope you enjoy that. Give us all the inside on next week. Big weekend next week. Are you going to come back and join us, Chris Cook, next week? You'll have me, definitely. We absolutely will. We're going to do a slightly different show for you next week. Stay tuned to find out. That's all we've got time for this week, though, on What a Shout. It's been good fun, hasn't it? Oh, great fun. Well worth jumping out of bed at four in the morning. For <laughs> <laughs> I was an hour later and I'm still feeling the pinch. You've just you've just lifted the lid on the mechanics of the show there, Chris. <laughs> and everyone will be chuckling out there. Pat Cooney, of course, it was easy for you. Just rolled out of bed and into the home office again. Yeah, yeah. I'm normally coming back from the nightclub about five in the morning, so it's no stretch for me. <laughs> Another confession from Cooney. Don't worry, he's got to go up to Beverly. We'll <laughs> let it rain. Uh, thanks, Pat. We'll have you next week. That'll be great. Chris, you as well. 
all good stuff, isn't it? Enjoy the stuff that we've gone through this week. If you enjoy the show, let us know. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Don't forget to download the free Must Have Racing Post app. You can do it on the App Store or the Google Play Store itself. Remember, gamble responsibly. So much still coming up this weekend. And of course, do enjoy the sport. <laughs>